Welcome to the Regenerative Rising Podcast, Elevating Voices, Activating Change. I'm your guest host, Jesse Delo. Uh, I'm glad to return to the show and be joined by two exceptional leaders today, David Vetter of Grain Place Foods and Christy Lewis, founder of Quinn Snap. Uh, David Vetter, president and CEO of Grain Place Foods, has been living an ongoing experiment in how to grow food in a way that is both regenerative to the soil and economically viable for the people who farm. The mission of Grain Place Foods is to provide to its customers grain products that are grown and produced in an ecologically sustainable and socially responsible manner with the conviction that how your food is produced does matter. Welcome, Dave. I'm glad to have you here today. Thank you. And our second guest, Christy Lewis. Um, since starting Quinn 10 years ago, Christy has been a pioneer in agriculture and ingredient transparency. Christy invented and patented a Pure Pop microwave popcorn bag, which is the first bag without chemical or plastic coatings. They launched a line of gluten-free and grain-free pretzels. And Quinn's farm-to-bag policy connects consumers directly to the source where the ingredients come from and their Be Better, Do Better mission takes these farm-to-bag relationships a step further by encouraging growers to improve agricultural practices that will not only benefit them, but also the planet. Thanks for being here today, Christy. Thanks for having us, Jesse. So your reputations precede you both, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, I think there's a lot that we could talk about, and we'll see where the, we go with this, but I'd like to start by learning more about your relationship. Um, and so I'm gonna start with you, Christy. Can you share more about the journey that led you to David and Grain Place Foods? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was a long time ago. So I would say about nine to 10 years ago. And I was looking, we were sourcing popcorn, organic popcorn kernels, and we were super small. So I literally only needed like, I think it was like three pounds of popcorn at the time. Um, and I had called every single ingredient supplier. I knew nothing about the industry. Um, I was just Googling, you know, organic popcorn kernels. Um, and after many months of trying to kind of understand um, where this popcorn was being grown, because I wanted to know where it was coming from and I couldn't get any transparency on it. Um, I found Grain Place, um, on a Google search and I picked up the phone and, and called and, um, and spoke to Dave and, and the rest is history. <laughs> so I feel like if it hadn't been for Google, I don't know where this would have gone, but um, I'm grateful that, you know, this is where we are because Dave put me on kind of a different, um, a different path uh, just in, in the way that he, he was farming and um, his leadership and his big thinking, it, it definitely was like an oh wow moment of, um, I wasn't just sourcing, you know, organic popcorn kernels, but I was learning so much during that whole process. But yeah, it was Google. Thank, thank goodness for Google. <laughs> All right, so you, when you started this, popcorn was your first ingredient that you were looking for and Google was your tool to find that organic popcorn kernel. Um, how has that changed today? Do you still go to Google to find those ingredients? Yeah, no, I do actually. Um, I It's through, you know, friends of friends. So if we're looking for a supplier or a grower, you know, Dave, I definitely call Dave a lot and, and kind of um, try to get that from him. I mean, you have mad ag. I mean, there's so many different people in the industry who um, have built these major relationships within the supply chain. Um, but I'm always... I'm always Googling because, you know, there's so many, so many growers and so many farmers um, that I just don't know and that others don't know. So um, I do think that's been really helpful. But of course, ne after 10 years, I've built these relationships in the industry where I can call and, and see, oh my gosh, where are you getting this? Where are you getting that? Do you have any recommendations? Who should I talk to? Whereas, you know, way back when I really didn't have anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 10 years is uh, a lot of time when we think about regenerative coming up and where organic has evolved into. Um, and so maybe Dave, I can kind of pass it to you here and ask a little bit more that when, you know, when Christy approached you, um, cause you've been on this journey for decades. Um, so when Christy approached you, you know, where was Grain Place at when, when you met and, and how did that kind of influence the way the relationship got started? Well, 
we've always tried to uh, work with uh, somebody that's come up with, with new ideas or things that are a little different. And that's kind of what we've built our business on. And uh, anything that comes with that kind of excitement and passion that Christy uh, demonstrated in that first phone call, I'm, I'm ready to work with them any way I can. And that's was kind of the things that we've done with a number of, of our key customers today. And that's how we started. They asked me if I could do something or they had an idea for something and we figured it out. And so that I've always enjoyed that part of it, figuring out how to do something everybody else told them they couldn't do. So uh, that, that has been, been the most fun. And then watching on the farm side of things, watching what's happened to our soils over the last 45 years. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about what has happened? Um, you know, we've, we've got a problem these days that we face in the spring, uh, getting soils dry enough to work because we hold so much water. And from early on uh, in the mid seventies, uh, getting the rain and seeing most of it run off the field. And now we're, we've been able to handle six inches in about two hours and lose very little. So those kinds of things make a, a big difference. The horsepower changes and requirements for uh, simple basic tillage. We don't do a lot of heavy tillage, but uh, we do once in a while as we go through our nine year rotation now. But uh, you know, we can do things with uh, less horsepower or the same amount of horsepower and larger equipment now that we couldn't do uh, in the mid seventies. Probably one of the biggest things that I, I noticed and changed early on was uh, in the horsepower required to do the tillage that we were doing, and then the uh, increased uh, number of acres I could till in the same time with less fuel. But beginning argument I had with my dad, you know, I lost most of those. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I didn't think we'd see that much change that quickly. And, uh, but it didn't show, it didn't show up in yields. It showed up in, in time spent in the field and horsepower required to do some of those basic tillage things that we need to do to do row crops. So when you got started, it was mostly just you on your own land. Um, what is the relationship in the farm network and the supply shed kind of look it, like? It changes a lot over time. Uh, our business changes and what we need and, and the crops that we need that we don't grow ourselves. Uh, in the very early days when we started our processing facility, we probably produced uh, uh, 75 to 80%, maybe more of the organic products we handled on our own farm here. And now it's probably less than uh, one or 2%. And we buy from farmers now from Saskatchewan to Texas and from California to Michigan, Ohio. We, we go to where the crops that we need for our ingredients are, have the best chance of producing the best quality. And we have stuff that we can grow here, but there's other soils and other production environments that can grow a better quality uh, crop. And so that's where we go. It sounds like, you know, you both derive a lot of value out of the relationship you have. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that, you know, and, and as far and wide as you want to interpret that value, whether it's friendship, somebody you can call and, and kind of have a better market intelligence, you know, is it access to, uh, you know, a large supply shed or just knowing there's eight, 10 crops out there that be used for experimentation. Um, and Christy, how do you interpret the value derived from these direct trade relationships at your food company? Yeah, I mean, I think Dave definitely is a, a special one to me because, um, again, I started wanting to clean up my gray popcorn, um, not really knowing how I was going to do that, but knowing that I wanted to start with, you know, a, a, a compostable biodegradable paper for the bag. Um, but I was kind of going into this area where I, I knew nothing, right? Um, and so that was the idea. Um, Fast forward, you know, a couple of months to almost a year later, I met Dave and it was really eye-opening. I think it was really eye-opening when I first visited Grain Place, but just talking to him about, um, you know, crops and planting and 
you know, as a consumer for my whole life, I was not on that side, right? Um, growing up in Connecticut, I mean, I was, I knew nothing, like truly nothing. And so um, there was this fundamental disconnect between, you know, what I was eating and where it was, it was coming from, and then who was growing it and why and how. Um, and so connecting with Dave definitely put us on a different trajectory of, you know, our farm to bag policy and our initiatives on that. And then learning so much about, you know, why he and his dad were growing this way and what they were trying to change and revolutionize. And, and you have this North star, um, Dave is the North star of where, you know, ag should get to. And, and I think it's really defining on, and how you get there. Like Quinn, we're focused on trying to, con, you know, trying to con convert the 99% of conventional and kind of push it towards the right direction. Um, and wherever that is, I mean, it's like meeting with the growers where they are today, not striving for perfection, but yet you have Dave as this, this kind of model, right. That you're trying to strive to get to. Um, and so just, I mean, just learning and listening to Dave over the years. I mean, we'll have conversations where he said something to me nine years ago and it's resonating differently, you know, when he says it again, you know, a year ago, right? So I think it's just in my own evolution of trying to understand what what I'm trying to do with Quinn and then kind of tapping into this genius of, you know, he's living and breathing the soil and he's, he's doing something so amazing um, that we all have so much to learn from him and what he's been able to build at Green Place. Um, so I don't, I, I think that really there's so much to learn. There's so much I have learned, um, but it's hard to really kind of articulate all of that because there really is so much. Um, I have like a thousand stories where I'm like, oh my gosh, what did you just say? Can you say it again? Like, I need to absorb that in a different way. I have no idea what you just said, but I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to learn. <laughs> um, but there's so much value and, and really trying to, again, you know, when we're talking to other growers, out there and, and other farmers who are interested in this, like I'm always pointing them to look at Green Place and to to chat with Dave Vetter and to, to learn from him. Um, I'll send articles and, and videos, but they're, um, they want to learn and, and want to change. Um, and there's no, there's no better teacher than, than Dave. There truly isn't. And so um, there's so much value there from, from the ag perspective, but then also just as a mentor, as someone who's who's doing good to do good, right? There's, that's really important to me. Um, yeah, and I think what Quinn has done really well is really interpret that personal relationship and that personal learning into the way that you talk about your brand and the way that your products show up on shelf. Like Dave's story is on your product. And I think that's really encouraging. It, you know, David, when you hear Christy talk about that, you know, does that, well, one, I'm curious, like, what is the value you derive for the relationship? And also wondering, are you doing this for other food companies or other brands? Or is it kind of special the way that Christy shows up in, in inquiry and curiosity? We, we've done uh, some similar things with other brands and help them develop products and, and, uh, help them build networks for ingredients that we don't knew do and uh, stuff, but not as probably as much as we've done uh, with, with Christy. I keep having to caution her and let her know that uh, what I don't know doubles every day. And it's been doing that for 40 years. So um, I, yeah, there's so much to learn yet that we don't know. And our approach to what we're doing with the farm, we look at the whole project as an experiment because we started with the idea that there has to be a way to develop a, ma a management system, a cropping system that's self-regenerating and self-renewing, not relying on outside inputs. So we've put some uh, uh, checks and balances in how we approach what we're doing and have purposely not gone to uh, outside inputs for a, for a number of things once we reached a certain point. And so we're still working on that, trying to figure out what we can do with, with our cropping systems and with rotations and what we grow in those rotations and where, and to see if we can do that. Uh, we've managed to survive about 20 years without doing outside inputs other than seed and fuel, uh, but we've got a long ways to go yet. And uh, 
we started with the idea that there has to be a way. So we keep going, realizing that we haven't really discovered it yet. So that's been an interesting part for us uh, here on the farm and, and uh, always trying to increase diversity and complexity in what we do. But realizing that when you take those steps, you increase the amount of work or the amount of labor required in that process. And you lose some efficiencies of scale. And uh, so those are all issues that we try to work with on the farm. On the food side, the processing side, that was something we decided to do because we were limiting our own access to markets on our certified organic uh, stuff that we were growing in the uh, late 70s and getting access to that minimal value added so that it was a usable product for end users. And uh, so that was one of those decisions we make and we talked about it a long time and, and uh, you know, my dad was, was 60 at the time and uh, had some health issues and, and uh, I don't know if it was wise to start when interest rates were approaching uh, 19%, but um, we decided we would rather do it and, and fail than always wondered if we could have made it work and uh, jumped in. But in those early days, had it not been for the export market, and the relationships we were able to build with customers in, in uh, uh, Western Europe and Japan, uh, we probably wouldn't have survived. And, uh, but we're we, glad we do it, but it's been growing pains on a continuous basis. About the time we think we're ready to handle the next stage of growth, we find out that we're, again, too small <laughs> to do what uh, customers are asking us to do. And so that's, that's always a hard, hard piece to do. We have more opportunity than, than we have people to help make it work. Yeah, I feel like that concept is a major theme around regenerative right now. And, you know, we're responding to a system that's been built for efficiency and productivity. We've got some niche markets around here. Um, organic has expanded but we know where it's expanding and it's not so much in the United States for production. And so as we kind of mm -hmm. develop these regenerative models and these systems and hopefully regenerative supply chains, I think we have to get through that challenge of growth state, right? Like how are we gonna get big enough to make this economically viable? But how do we make sure it's right sized so that we maintain value at the farm? Dave, do you have some thinking around that about how to, Hold that together? Um, we have some opportunities with some products that we've been working with for a number of years, but the issue is we're okay with, with small niche markets, but the market opportunity and the product quality is there to grow it well. But as one small operation, we can't scale it up because we do not have the resources to invest in building significant inventories to take on enough supply base reserves to uh, take uh, uh, to support a larger customer or end user and then still have the ability to grow it. And that's the same thing that we faced back in the uh, early days in the, in the late seventies. Um, our first significant customer was uh, White Wave. And uh, that's back, what, 1977. And in less than five years, he outgrew a group of farmers that we were working with and a couple of other others, our ability to supply what he needed with uh, uh, organic uh, soy. And that's when he went the other direction because his business was growing so fast. Turned back to it, but still that was a problem and we faced that in other issues. We run into that with popcorn when we first introduced that. Um, I think we had our first uh, certified production scale on popcorn in 1978. And uh, I think it was probably the largest operation and it was little <laughs> at that time. So those are the kinds of things that we've gone through before. Um, our whole farming operation was certified organic in 78. Uh, but it took us until 95 to be able to sell all that we grew in an organic market. So it's uh, growing something and having enough supply to grow 
We've seen cycles where farm gate prices have declined from where they were before. And part of that is because there wasn't enough supply to take on that next set of customers that wanted to grow the market. And now uh, Im imports are filling a lot of that and we're losing that opportunity domestically. But those were things that we observed on more than one occasion. And once we increase supply enough, but it takes uh, farmers being willing to hold and invest in the market to maintain that supply. If you get started with a customer and you can't, can't keep them supplied, uh, they're not a customer again. And so that's always a part that's been of concern to me to make sure we have enough supply to take on what we do. Uh, if we lose other producers or um, we have a bad crop season. We had a product that we contracted several hundred acres one year, scattered all the way from Montana to Saskatchewan, to Manitoba, to the Dakotas. And every area we had contracted acres had severe weather issues. So that we spread them out to try and buffer our uh, supply base against those kinds of issues. And it hit us in every production area the same year. So those are things out there that you can't control that you have to try to plan for. And uh, usually you guess wrong, but you know, <laughs> you keep going. Yeah, and hopefully you have a bunch more seasons to keep guessing and get a bunch of them right. So <laughs> yeah, it, it is a journey. Um, and and Christy, I, I wonder when you hear some of that story and think about you know where your company is at. And I think we had conversations a couple months ago in a different context. You know, you know, brands have that experience of you get to that success point where it's there's pressure to grow. Um, and how do you maintain you know the values and the mission? that the company is on and also kind of balance all of those economics and, and the desire to get more market share and keep spreading, you know, the word and the products across the consumer base. And what does that experience look like at Clint's Next? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always kind of this evolution and then you're growing and then you're backtracking and <laughs> you're growing again. So um, we've we have handled it depending on the ingredient. Um, you know, we had sorghum um, that we were working really closely with the growers um, and then we had an issue and then we had to bring it somewhere else with a blender and they were doing all the sourcing and we had no visibility into that. Um, but it was one of those situations where we could either run the product right on the line um, or not run it. Um, so live or die essentially. And so we, we chose live and we're now, um, we're trying to kind of go in the other direction of doing what we did before, which was establish a good working relationship directly with the growers and, and leaning in on, you know, their practices. Um, we, we, we did a kind of this, this test, which, which failed. <laughs> so we're learning from that and we're going to try um, again this coming year, but it's, um, it's never an overnight thing, right? And you have to really plan for it, um, build and start those relationships and then work with them and, and figure out depending on the ingredients. I mean, a lot of our ingredients come from overseas um, and that is, it's really just the ones that can't be grown here, right? So cassava, tapioca, um, we get potato starch from Europe, um, and then the rest is here. Um, but it's it's trying to manage all of those relationships and, and, and figure out um, how we're gonna keep up with the demand and the supply, um, but while working with our, our growers and, and trying to clearly like have an impact on the agriculture practices. Um, so that's been a, that's been such a challenge. We're a small team, so we definitely had bandwidth um, issues <laughs> for sure. Um, but it is, I feel like when you're small, like when you just start, you have you have to go through you know distributors and and third party suppliers. And then when you're you're kind of at it for a little bit, then you have the opportunity to kind of lean in with some growing partners. Um, but then also when you're scaling, you're trying to, you know, stay there, but then also kind of broaden out and bring other partners to the table. So if you're testing sorghum, for example, you want to work with one grower, but then you also want to have five other growers 
because in Dave's case, you know, if you're contracting out everyone um, and there's an issue with the weather, then you don't have supply and then you're, you have to go in a different direction. So that to manage all that's really challenging. I mean, so many brands are just, they're contracting out just an ingredient. Like that's not what we're trying to do. So we make everything overly complex here, um, which we're trying to simplify the process. But I remember Dave, I remember this so vividly because we were standing, um, I was standing outside in our parking lot in Woburn, Mass, talking to him. It was 2011. And I think there was, I forget what happened in 2011, Dave, but something happened with corn. There were some crop issues. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Like our whole, our whole brand is popcorn right now. And you were like, well, you can't control mother nature. And I, you would think that I would understand that you can't. Um, but I was still so naive and so ignorant to like the world that I was like, okay, you're right. I can't like, we just got to roll through it and, and figure it out. And it worked out fine. Right. Um, but it is, it is really challenging for a brand who is trying to do the right thing, um, with our growers and our sourcing, but at the same time, we're trying to grow. So you're really trying to manage like where, where am I going to take a hit and be okay with it? And where am I going to really lean in to build these relationships? It's not going to be 100% perfect all the time. Um, and you're going to have to pivot and adapt to certain situations and certain, certain seasons and certain, certain challenges, but it has really been challenging. I will say that it is totally not easy. Yeah. I love how the way you describe the, although you talk about it literally, you know, it's this cyclical chaotic, you know, path forward and, there is movement and you are growing in a direction, but uh, it, it doesn't always feel like that. There are a lot of setbacks to running your own business. <laughs> we'll win here and then fail here. So you're just trying to manage all of that um, as, as we, as we, as we try and learn and understand more about, you know, farming practices and, and what our growers need and what they're looking for. And then trying to figure out how to actually work with them because a lot of times you can, we can find growers to do pretty much like anything that we want provided we're, you know, taking that, that from them, right. We're purchasing the crop. The challenge is, is then you're, you need to clean and mill and um, that's where that gets complicated as Dave is, is fully aware. I've asked him a thousand (laughs) different things over the last 10 years. Um, So the infrastructure isn't really there. Um, and we need to really work on the infrastructure with the smaller, the smaller, smaller growing partners. Um, not necessarily like the larger ones, because that's not what we're focused on. Um, but there's definitely challenges there for sure. Dave, do you remember what happened in 2011 with the popcorn? I can't remember what happened yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I can't either. Uh, no, I'm not sure, but it could have been any number of things. Uh, <laughs> We, we always have, have those issues. Um, one of the things that we're seeing increasingly more that is really concerns me is, is issues around mycotoxins in, in a variety of the grain stuffs that we work with. And uh, that is something that we haven't really figured out how to manage around yet. Uh, we know there are some things that help that, but they kind of go counter to other things. You know, more tillage seems to help reduce the incidence <laughs> We're trying to get away from more tillage because it's destructive of soil. Uh, residue is another thing that may lead to more of that because it's uh, origins with, with a variety of molds. So um, those are issues that we're, we're seeing more of and we've seen the, the incidence of that increase uh, probably uh, more in the last 10 to 12 years than it was prior to that. Uh, we were collecting uh, samples around the Midwest region here for a mycotoxin uh, research project and and, uh, we didn't find them very often and uh, now we find them frequently so um, those are what's your theory on that Dave like why um, well there's when you've got uh, more tillage you're exposing more soil to to sun and and, uh, drying which is not so favorable to molds and, and their spores so uh, that's one thing that reduces that. And the more residue or, that you have, why there's uh, more opportunity for those molds to, to have a home and, and to grow. 
and that, you know, they're typically present anyway. And uh, so if you've got a, a long wet season and you can't harvest on a timely basis, that increases risk. So there's all those environmental factors that make a difference. And I've always wondered if the, our heavy reliance on uh, pesticides from fungicides to insecticides to herbicides don't have some impact on the, the, the native biology in our soils that maybe takes away some of those organisms or suppresses them that would be a, a, a counter to or a competitor for those molds. I don't know. That's always something that runs through the back of my mind. And uh, so those are all of those things to deal with. And as we have more testing, of course, we run into more issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, how do we manage uh, not only our cropping systems, but how we store grain to keep those at a minimum because they can't increase while stuff is in storage. So all of those things are something that we continue to deal with on a, on a daily basis, actually. And uh, so, and we're seeing them now in grains that we haven't seen them in in the past. So that's another one of those things, the same way with cross-contamination from GMOs. And uh, I don't think there is a suitable border or a barrier that you can put around an organic farm that's gonna actually be effective might help reduce it, but it's not going to stop it or prevent it. We've observed cross-contamination that we know carried uh, more than uh, more than a half a mile, and in some cases more than a mile. And uh, it, there's nothing to stop it. I, outside of putting a dome over the farm, and that doesn't seem very cost-effective to me, uh, or very env environmentally friendly either, for that matter. <laughs> and uh, so those are all issues that, that we look at and that we have to deal with on certification on farms too, about cross-contamination issues. And you can't control what the weather does and you can't control what your neighbors do. So those are probably bigger factors than what you actually do on the farm. Right. So that's always, always a question mark there uh, about how you handle that and what you do with it, except monitor closely. And that's not that's not very cheap to do either. Right. So um, I want to take a moment to let our audience know that we're listening to the Regenerative Risings podcast, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. And I'm your guest host, Jesse Delo. Today I'm speaking with David Better and Christy Lewis. Um, Christy, I wanted to kind of touch on, you know, some of what Dave's talking about right now about the changes in the system and, you know, things that are going to both affect the farming system, but also the product and your focus on communicating regenerative and organic and the benefits of that. Farm data, surveys, all of that stuff is, you know, keeps us very busy. Um, how do you approach that? You know, working with Dave, knowing he's got decades and decades of experience and he's committed to this, how do you manage through this need for a relationship, but also data to communicate to all of your stakeholders, you know, the value of the work you're doing? Yeah, I mean, we haven't implemented data yet. And I know that sounds crazy. Um, but our, the way that I think about it is that when you're having the, it's relationship first, right? Especially when you're talking to conventional growers, um, you're trying to really tell the story of and convincing them almost like that there is a better way, right? And now there's, there's, we're so lucky that, you know, what, probably seven years ago, when I trying to convince them to do certain things like reduce pesticides, you know, take out all of that. They'd look at me like I had, you know, five heads where now there's so much happening around regenerative agriculture and so many stories about, you know, case studies with growers that I think everyone's kind of letting their guard down a little bit and warming up to this idea that we can do it differently. Um, there is a better way. Um, but for Quinn, it's really like leaning in and building relationships first and then understanding, like try and figure out what their challenges are. And that's individual farmers in different regions of the entire you know, country. So what, you know, one person's challenge is, is definitely not the others, right? So you're trying to kind of manage through that. Um, and then really kind of meet them in the middle. Okay, if they're 100% conventional farming, what would it look like if they implemented crop rotation? What would it look like if they, you know, 
reduced pesticides by 50% one year, 80% the next year, 100% the next year, right? Um, I think it really just depends. I mean, for us, and, and Dave said this, I think, I forget when you said this, Dave, but, um, you know, to truly have regenerative soil, right, and regenerative ag, you can't kill off the living organisms with pesticides and herbicides. So that's like the biggest thing for me is how can we get that out? But then also you need to make sure that, you know, when you're doing that, your soil is healthy, right? So it can thrive and your, your crops can thrive from it. So it's kind of like a little, a little bit of, um, kind of chicken the exit scenario. Um, but we're, we're really just trying to encourage them to move forward in a different direction and, and not strive for perfection, not strive to demand something. Um, the fact that, you know, some of these growers are really excited about change and the opportunity to do better on their land for their kids and their grandkids. Um, that's where we try and lean in on. Um, I know that there is some day soon that we're going to start needing to, to understand from a numbers perspective and try and get a base of what that looked like and what it looks like now. But when you talk about data up front, it makes people very nervous, right? And then you're, you're not kind of... Um, you're taking just this like this daunting kind of negative approach where it really should be kind of this innovative, um, motivative to do things differently. And let's just start. So if that's two acres, if that's 40 acres, if that's a hundred acres, um, if that's a little bitty area where we can see what happens, like that's all we're asking. And again, it, it's, it really depends on who you're talking to. Um, some folks want to go all the way to transitional and then all the way to organic. Great. How can we help them through that process? How can we buy transitional? How can we pay more for their efforts? Um, and so that's what we're, we're really trying to lean in on. Um, once we achieve that, then yes, like one or two years later, then we'll kind of go in and, and get some data um, so we can report back on our efforts. But I think for, for Quinn, like we're not about, look at what we're doing. We did this to this, like, it's not about us. It's about what we're doing for the land and what those farmers are doing every day. Um, so let's try and help them do better um, and not make it harder for them to do better, not put these strict standards and these certifications and these demands on them. Cause that's when I think the system falls apart and it breaks. Um, so we're, we're not trying, we're not trying to do it that way, um, which I know is hard for everyone to wrap their head around, but. But I think the idea of meeting farmers where they're at right now, I mean, I think we all understand where we wish the system would work and how it would operate, but we really do need to kind of understand where everyone is at right now and not make a lot of assumptions. So, and, yeah. and David, I'm really curious, you know, you've been working with, with farmers for a long time and, you know, mostly organic and specialty farmers, uh, but, you know, everyone, I feel like the conversation is starting to change. You know, farmers are either at an age where they're getting a little fed up or they want something different or they're hearing about all these new markets developing and they're kind of curious about how they get in. But I'm, you know, don't spend a lot of time out in farm country. And so I'm kind of curious from you, like, is the conversation changing? Are farmers asking different questions? I, I don't know that they're necessarily asking different questions or that the conversation is changing that much but there are more conversations. And, and so that, that's a positive uh, kind of a piece, I think, it at least says they're thinking about things a little different or are curious enough to at least ask questions uh, when there's a time when, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen at all. And uh, so that, I think that's, that's a positive thing. And, and uh, you know, I, I have neighbors that are, conventional with all of the latest technology stuff around and I, I share crop rotations with them and and that kind of stuff so they know what we're doing because our rotation impacts what they can do because a lot of them grow uh, hybrid seed corn for for the big uh, seed companies and so cross-pollination becomes an issue and they have setback limitations and our crops keep moving all around the farm so where we grow them one year and where we grow them the next might be a mile apart. And uh, 
and or a half a mile apart, and they may have the distance barriers of, of a half to three quarters of a mile. So um, it impacts what they can do with their cropping as well. And uh, but I just tell them, come look, you can see what we're doing. Here's my cropping forecast. It may or may not change, but probably not for a few years. We're, we have evolved into a, a nine year rotation system now, and we've been through it twice, but we think it takes at least two to three cycles of that rotation to really evaluate what it's doing or not doing for you. So uh, if we expand that and grow that, I'm not sure I'll see the results, but uh, in, anyway, we've done some things to try and make sure that somebody's here to see those, so. You're gonna see them. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll keep working on it uh, like that to try to find it, but the, our door's always open. Um, anybody wants to come see what we're doing, we say, come down, we'll make time for you. And uh, we just had a, a, a sheet metal business in Grand Island wanting to come visit the, the plant and stuff to see what we're doing. So you never know where the inquiry is going to come from or who's going to want to come and ask questions. But if they're interested enough to do that, you don't want to don't want to uh, say no. Right. So so those get to be expensive. Uh, time periods away from doing things I ought to be doing, but uh, yeah, that's what I was going to streamline that, Dave, and and do all of this on on YouTube so you can direct them there. So, so, but uh, anyway, those those pieces I think have been important to to our own business over the years because there's, you know, when we started here, I think the closest other farmer that was even close to doing what we were doing or becoming certified organic was like 60, 70 miles away. And uh, we probably have 15 of them now within 20 miles. So, uh, but partly I think that's because we put a facility in place where they had a place a delivery point. And even if we weren't their ultimate customer, we had the infrastructure to make it happen for them. So I think that's been an important piece in, in growing it. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to take away. That's why we built the business is to try to do that. So, cause it, it was killing us. I mean, we had the, we had the good product that people wanted, but getting that intermediate process, that simple process done so that a manufacturer could use it was, it was a tricky part. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that still believe there's a build it and they will come when it comes to infrastructure, but it's not quite that straightforward. You know, these things need to be kind of driven from the ground up. Like the farmers have to be willing to do it. You need to be able to have supply and it, there needs to be some sort of demand and getting that dance to happen. Uh, it, it's, oh. it's an art, not a science, right? It's not driven by numbers. It's driven by relationships. W would you agree, Dave? Uh, yeah, relationships have been key to just about everything that we've built here. And uh, uh, early on uh, with the farmers we worked with, it was ended up meeting farmers at workshops on organic agriculture or, or uh, small conferences around the area and uh, being able to put something together and then having customers find that you're out here. <laughs> And, and come and check with you. You know, one, one, of, uh, one of our earliest customers we started working with regularly in the early 1980s was uh, uh, Mountain Peoples out in California. So um, hearing about you and then coming out to visit, you know, big order in that days might be 3,000 pounds uh, of stuff going that way. And it probably was made up of uh, 15 or 16 different products. So. There was no, no uh, how do you want to put it, efficient volumes of anything going anywhere for, for many years, unless it was export. And then it was pretty much container lots. Right. Right. But you got to start somewhere and it's always one piece at a time, one farmer at a time. Yep. And how do you think farmers are making those decisions? You know, I, I, I feel like there's different camps of people thinking about Farmer decision making, and yeah, you know, there's endless research in it. But what are you seeing? You know, what what's the trade offs and balance, and that they're trying to weigh? 
Well, one of the things that I see is that some farmers that are making that change have seen the connection between the toxic materials that are in use in agriculture and their impacts on their family health. Uh, so I've, so I've seen those, that piece of it. The other one is just pure economics for what they can look at potential production and what they can get for what they call a premium price. Um, but uh, I don't think it's a premium price. And I think probably most of our organic products are underpriced at the farm for what we're asking farmers to do and the responsibility we're asking them to take because we don't have the public to step up and, and pay the cost of doing the other stuff that we see on the conventional side. So that, that's a piece of it, and we try to emphasize that. Um, but increasing the, the value of diversity, I know one of the farmers we worked with trying to, to raise, a, raise a family and what he's using and putting on the soils in his fields makes it unsafe for his kids to go play in the farm. So it, it's those kinds of things that are, are a piece of it. But the, uh, another one is just the economics side of it. And typically that can bring somebody to the table. And if they stay, that's because they see additional value in it. Um, if they don't stay, they weren't really committed in the first place. And uh, so, and we've seen that move both ways. So, but you gotta start somewhere. And uh, we've always tried to, to make things work with new farmers. And we had some good partners in the early years that worked with marketing and and distribution with us that helped us make that grow. And on our own operation, and I know they in their own operation, several times probably bought stuff from farmers that we shouldn't have uh, because we were trying to encourage them to grow and to get better at what they were doing. And I keep looking back at the number of, of things that we bought from farmers and ended up composting. So, so uh, it, it's, uh, things like that, that, that you do, and you just put that in as part of the cost of doing business. So, but. Yeah, um, so I wanna pivot a little bit to kind of get here from both of you, like what is your take on this regenerative movement? You know, I think um, there's a lot of things that are getting built into this. You know, I think some folks are focused on soils and carbon and developing markets for ecosystem services. There's other folks that are, um, and not mutually exclusive by any means, but there are other people that are thinking about equity and financial systems and you know the systemic discrimination that has prevented people from participating in these systems. How do you tease all of this apart and do your job every day? Like what becomes your focus? Maybe I'll send it to you, Christy, first. Yeah, I mean, I think truly the focus is, well, the focus started where, um, you know, that the health and the safety of what we were feeding to our families um, was why, you know, I'm still here after 11 years of getting kind of <laughs> knocked down. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure Dave has a lot of whys, he's still here too, but it's, it's the right thing to do. And I wanted to, to kind of challenge others to do things differently because we can, like we, we have the ability to do it differently. So we should just based on pure ethics. And so for me, it was, um, I have three little boys. I had just had Quinn and I was like, this whole system is completely messed up. There's got to be a different way. Um, just from like the consumer package good standpoint. And then clearly when you're, you're going and you're understanding like how we're sourcing ingredients and what that looks like. I mean, it's been trying to go back to, I always use going back to basics because I never, I mean, this is when I didn't understand regenerative ag or, you know, really even organic. I mean, I knew organic, but I, I didn't, know that there was way more than just organic and and what you were doing on your land and the practices you were doing to rebuild this the soil and how that's all you know impactful right um but it really for me was about the cleanest ingredients possible and how we got there um was critical 
And that's kind of our focus. Um, also doing better for the land, um, rebuilding, you know, the ecosystem, doing things the right way. I mean, doing things that mother nature intended us to do and, and going back in that direction, not in this industrialized, you know, spitting out more and more and more and more and more quantity versus quality. Like that's kind of what, what we've been trying to do. And that's how I look at it. Um, that said, like economics, like the, the economics of something is really challenging when you're building a, a, a CPG brand, right? Um, you're weighing, you know, organic versus conventional, you're weighing organic now versus transitional versus, you know, conventional regenerative. And there's no, you know, there's nothing defining that, right? Just yet. Um, but so I, I try and think about all of it. And then we try and, and, and weigh that and do the right thing um, in certain avenues. And we might have to sacrifice a little here so we can do the good thing over here. And so that's what we've been trying to do, but, um, it really comes down to the health and the safety, um, of our families and the future generations to come and what we're doing to make sure that they're, um, they're protected from all the stuff that we had just lived through. Right. Um, and, and rebuilding a good future for them on the land, what they're eating, their health. I mean, it's all systematic. It, it goes, it's, it's the whole thing. And it literally starts from the soil. Um, so that's what we're focused on, but it's definitely, it's not perfect. There's not a model for it. We're always learning, um, but, but that's really the drive that is what we're trying to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Leading towards, you know, healthy, nutritious food for families. And, and taking care of the people that are working in these systems. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave, how would you kind of respond to that question? You know, what are, what are those new and emerging opportunities, whether it's in regenerative as a concept or a system, you know, what's yeah. going to change across the food and the regenerative or, or the, uh, what we, we call it uh, self-regenerating or self-renewing systems that we looked at trying to start to develop and, from the very beginning, realizing at that point in time that we're all dependent on this thin layer of soil on the earth's crust here for our survival. And uh, if we don't take care of that, uh, there really is not much of a future. But the other thing that I learned from my experience in, in uh, missions back in the days when I was in, in seminary and working with uh, community development and some things like that in some communities that that unless we started addressing that issue that it's really difficult for us to treat uh, our fellow man with any kind of justice if we don't provide and work with maintaining a healthy environment because almost every time that when we don't do that that's because we're extracting resources and wealth in terms of soil and local health and local environmental conditions and moving them somewhere else. And uh, to get away from that, you have to have locally developed uh, and renewing systems. So that's kind of what set us off in this direction. And uh, that's, we've been working at that. And our basic thing is, you know, one at a time and uh, keep, keep going from there. Uh, and I guess that's why the door's always been open. What are you looking forward to this year? How, what, what hope does 2021 have? And I'm so glad to be not talking about 2020 finally, I'll just say that. Like, <laughs> but what, what, are you, what are you both looking forward to this year? What's keeping you optimistic, Dave? Uh, well, um, I've been working with trans farmers on transition here and we've got a really good team this year. So I'm looking for a little uh, more focused and, and uh, uh, sharper management decisions by my farming team here a little bit. I have a lot more confidence in them than what I've had in, in most of that team the last three or four years. So that, that is uh, uh, something that I'm really looking forward to. And then we have lots of opportunities to work with other, other companies. Um, none that I see at this point that have the vision that Christy has, which I really appreciate. And, uh, that, that kind of vision I see out there makes it easier to walk across the driveway to the office every day. And uh, so those are things that I'm looking for that's immediate to our own particular situation. But I see a number of potential customers out there that have a lot of opportunity. They're really interested in 
making sure they have a quality product out there that I'm hoping we can find a way to support. Nice. And uh, we are in a very low unemployment situation here. So help is always a critical issue for us and has been for years. Yeah, I think you bring up one of the most important pieces of agriculture right now is that we don't have enough people that can manage these systems and that want to do this work. And, and so I'm really encouraged, Christy, the way you talk about it, like meet people where they are, help them get on their journey to do what's right and what's better to keep them in business and keep them in farming. Because um, if we can take care of people, I think we can solve for the rest of the pieces. Um, so I really thank you, Paul, for Dave, for you bringing that up. Um, and Christy, what, what are you looking forward to this year? Yeah, um, uh, there's a couple of things. I mean, really getting the bandwidth to kind of focus and lean into our supply chain um, has been really challenging given there's so much going on at Quinn. Um, and I think that's going to free up in a, well, knock on wood, free up in a couple of weeks. And then um, we just hired uh, this um, intern, but we're going to hopefully move her into a full-time role, Grace. Um, she just graduated from the lead school over at, uh, in Boulder, and she's going to be focused on, you know, our sustainability initiatives within agriculture um, to kind of spearhead that, which we desperately need, um, and then work with our, our growers. And then also um, a big initiative is really our band of brands that we put together because um, we're seeing a lot of brands wanting to do better in their supply chain. Um, they just, they don't necessarily know how or where to start. Um, and so we're trying to kind of bring all of them together and then clearly like making those introductions where needed as, you know, if anyone's interested in organic popcorn, like come on with us and we can give, you know, Dave more business. I don't know if he wants more business, but <laughs> that type of stuff, um, working with, um, you know, mad ag on some projects that we're excited about, um, and then really just leaning into the supply chain. That's a, a big focus of mine. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can spend more time there. But, and we've gotten a lot of rain. So I think that's, that's good. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Hopefully not too much. <laughs> out there, but we're seeing a lot of rain come in. So that's promising. Yeah. Spring is always full of optimism and hope. And what I think was really cool about what holds you two together I mean, is that you're both out there developing coalitions. You're developing networks of people and thinkers like you that are going to keep moving this, this idea forward. And, and I feel really um, hopeful just knowing folks like you are out there doing this good work um, and, and getting some good traction and, and bringing more people into this way of thinking because uh, it is a hopeful and optimistic place to be. Um, and even though the system is not an easy one to manage through, uh, I think we should stay positive. And I hope that Regenerative continues to grow and expand. So um, I want to just thank you guys both for joining me today. Um, it was a real pleasure to speak with you and hear more about your relationship and all the work you've done together. Um, so thank you for joining us for this episode of Regenerative Rising's podcast, Elevating Stories and Activating Change. Hope to see you all again soon. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks.